just a moment. Okay. Hey, everybody, we're live. I'm Kim Coleman. I'm the founder of Paid Memberships Pro. And we have an excellent webinar for you today about SEO for your membership site. With me today is Lindsay Halsey. She's co-founder of a product, Pathfinder SEO. It's also a membership product. So we're going to get good insight on both sides of SEO and also the membership business. Their site helps people learn SEO through a guided program. She works with agencies, freelancers, and DIY creators like all of us. So we're happy to have her and we're happy to kick off this webinar. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, we're gonna dive right into it and talk about SEO for membership websites. Um, just for your information, we are gonna take a little pause in the middle of the webinar um, to answer a handful of questions. And then again at the end. So um, start pinging us with questions. We want this to be as interactive um, and helpful to you as possible. And so I want to start a little bit um, about looking at the commonalities between the websites um, that excel in the search results. So um, when websites are getting a lot of traffic from organic search from Google, um, they usually have three things in common that they do well. Um, they share their expertise. That's content. Um, there's some authority. Other people link to their websites and say they're, they're really, truly an expert in a given area. And then they engender trust um, through things like great design, the ability to contact a business, um, third party reviews, testimonials, et cetera. And so this spans the gamut. It doesn't know, matter small or large. Um, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. This concept of expertise, authority, and trust is a common thread throughout websites that excel in the search engines. And so one of the reasons why I'm really excited to be here today and talking to you all about membership websites is because you all in this audience excel in the department of sharing your expertise um, and being and having an authoritative um, amount of, of trust um, and, and those external factors um, around your business. You're, you're truly an expert in an area and you understand the concept of content. And so it is through um, search queries to your audience. Um, for instance, if you're in, in the membership site, um, around resumes and cover letters um, and job hiring. Um, it's through sharing your expertise um, in these platforms that you're going to be able to grow your traffic. I want to take a step back to the very beginning just for a couple minutes, since I know when we come into webinars, we're all in different places with our experience around a topic, um, and talk about the beginning of SEO, um, an introduction. And, uh, and so when I think about search engine optimization, um, I think of it as the art and the science of getting your website found in the free or organic space of Google, Yahoo, and Bing. And the goals are quite simple. Uh, we're trying to increase traffic, we're trying to increase the number of uh, leads your website's generating, and then ultimately we're trying to increase revenue and sales. And it can be really helpful as you get started with SEO to just understand a basic framework of how the search engines work. A lot of times this feels like kind of a black box where we don't really know um, how search engines work. They just deliver relevant results. And so we say, OK, um, you know, but if you go back to the beginning, it's sort of a, a basic three step process. Um, the first step in this process is that the search engine crawlers, um, also known as robots or spiders, crawl the web. Um, they go down all the avenues. They crawl through all the links on your website to the next page. They go from site to site. Um, and they create an index um, of the entire internet. Uh, and that index is kind of like an old fashioned Rolodex, right? They can pull information out of that index based on what their crawlers discovered. And then when you do a search on Google, um, an algorithm is utilized to deliver ranked results. And obviously, we're trying to be number one, not one number 100 um, in the mix. And, uh, and oftentimes, when we think about um, where sites excel in the search engines, one of the fundamental things is trying to make sure that their web pages are getting crawled in the first place. Um, and then the other big piece of the puzzle is then in this algorithm, um, which is proprietary, so it's, it's secret. Um, and there's a lot of different factors in it, but uh, we know that the different factors, that expertise, authority, and trust, those are the big factors. Those are the, the things that really matter. Um, and, and those are the components of the algorithm that we're trying to influence um, with our work. So that's a basic framework of how the search engines work. Um, and uh, the next thing we kind of need to understand about SEO is, is how do we break it apart? Um, 
it's it's can be an overwhelming topic because SEO is always evolving um, and that algorithm is proprietary. Um, but since we know there are different components, different things that we can do um, to improve our rankings, we can kind of bucket those out into four different pillars. Um, the first is technical SEO. And this is where I always start because if the search engines can't crawl and index your web pages, they can't show it in the algorithm in the search results. Um, and so we start with technical SEO. And technical SEO is going to include things like the speed of your pages loading. Um, it involves things like XML sitemaps and robots TXT files. Um, your technical SEO is going to look at um, your meta directives, the things that say what a search engine can index and what they shouldn't index. So it's a lot of behind the scenes components. And the best part um, about WordPress, one of the best parts, is that if you're using WordPress to power your website, to power your membership website, your technical SEO is already, generally speaking, really sound. You'll be at like the 90% mark out of 100% um, on technical SEO. So oftentimes there are some things we can do to fine tune our technical SEO, um, but the framework that you're using, the infrastructure is sound. And so um, there's, there's not a whole lot of work that you're gonna need to put into your technical SEO um, when you're on WordPress. So that's, that's always a benefit. The next piece of the puzzle is content. Um, and content matters and, and has mattered in the search engines um, essentially for all time. You'll hear the phrase content is king quite often. Uh, the search engines like content because it's how you share your expertise. Um, it's how they get to know what it is that you're really good at and what value you're adding essentially to the internet um, by, by sharing that expertise, by sharing that content online. And when we think about content and SEO, we oftentimes think straight into like blog posts um, because that's been where a lot of the talk and focus has been for the last few years is that websites need to blog to have great content. But content is actually really more broadly defined in my mind. It's your homepage content. It's the content on your contact page. It's the content that's even off your website. Um, maybe content um, that, that's out there on the internet because you're out on podcasts sharing your expertise there, or you have YouTube videos, um, or you're the guest on a webinar in, uh, in some kind of adjacent industry space. So content, in my mind's eye, is actually much more broadly defined than just what, what we initially think of when we think of content in SEO, which is blogging. The next piece of, of the pillars um, or, or component is on-site optimization. And this is really where we add context to our content. Um, so when the search engines crawl um, and read through um, a, a blog post, let's say it's one of those 2,000 plus word blog posts um, that takes a really big definitive deep dive into a, con a piece of content, it's via the on-site optimization um, that we break up that post and, and we make it easier for users to read things like headers, breaking up the sections. Um, we give the search engines the ability to market that content in the search uh, results by giving them a custom page title and a meta description. We add alternative text to our images um, so that the search engines know what the images are about and, and the accessibility mark of our page um, rises. And, uh, and we use internal links. We link between like pieces of content so people can take a deeper dive um, from one post into another or into a resource on an entire different website. So it's that um, on-site optimization that's gonna give the search engines more understanding and more ability to market your content. So that's a powerful piece of SEO. The last piece uh, or, or final pillar here is off-site SEO. Um, so we talked in the beginning about the idea of authority and trust. And a lot of times authority and trust comes from external resources. And so you can think about um, if you do a search um, for a piece of content, let's just say you're searching for um, something around a medical question. Um, do you want to read a blog post authored by a doctor or authored by an SEO, right? Somebody behind <laughs> the scenes like a ghostwriter writing um, content based on the research they're doing, or do you want the foremost expert um, on that topic, you know, a, a leading doctor in the field to be the author? Well, Google is trying to actually measure that for you. They're trying to see who's behind the content. Um, they're trying to understand the level of expertise a business has in a space. And one of the ways they do that is they look to external signals. They look to links pointing from other websites back to your website. 
Um, they look to reviews on third-party websites um, or on Google Maps. Um, they look at conversations. Um, they look at just mentions of a brand or mentions of an individual um, to try to get an understanding and to model essentially the real world, that real world scenario of you rather read the content written by that doctor. And so um, the only way for them to model the real world is to look at these external things like backlinks, uh, reviews, and, and general mentions. And so that's the world of offsite SEO. Um, in this, I've made all four pillars look uh, equal, right? And, and that's always a nice way to think about it. And, and the reason I've made them all equal, even though they probably really aren't, some of these factors are more powerful than others, is because in my experience, you can't really excel in SEO unless you've hit um, a pretty high bar in each one of these components. So um, it can be very tempting to say, I'm going to focus my time on technical SEO content and on-site optimization. It's all on my website. I'm really comfortable in that space, right? I'm really comfortable blogging. I'm really comfortable um, fixing broken links and trying to speed up my website. I love writing page titles and meta descriptions. Well, all of that work um, together is probably only like 60% of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. That offsite piece is actually proportionally more like 40% of the algorithm. And so you can't necessarily um, neglect any one component of these because uh, what we end up finding is, is that unbalanced kind of, um, you know, uh, if, if your pillars aren't balanced, if you're not putting effort into all of these, um, then you typically aren't gonna see the growth and the traffic that you're looking for. So that was a really quick overview to how the search engines work. Um, and now I really want to get more specific in the year industry in your space. Um, and I want to start by talking about the concept of restricting content and SEO. And, uh, and what we really need here is a framework to strike a balance between giving away your expertise for free um, because Google values it and you're using it to drive growth and, and it's a marketing channel. And then the obvious, um, really important part here, which is selling it. Um, you're trying to make money off your membership website. Um, this is your business. And so we can't give away everything. Um, we have to strike a balance. And so whenever I'm doing uh, this striking a balance uh, routine, I like to start um, at the very beginning. And so I, I talk, think through something and I say, okay, I'm gonna share my, a, a component of my expertise. Um, and uh, I am going to go back to the beginning on that topic. So um, you can kind of maybe jot down on a piece of paper all of the different facets of your expertise. There's obviously the big topic that you cover, but then there's all sorts of um, specific areas. You know, under I, my big topic is SEO, obviously, um, but under SEO, there's WordPress SEO, there's offering SEO services. There's technical SEO and content and Google Analytics. The list goes on. So my list of all of the areas where where I could share information, I could share expertise, um, kind of goes there. And then I grab any one of those topics that I'm thinking about maybe writing a blog post about, and I'm gonna explode the topic. And I do this because I'm too close to the topic. So I, uh, being an expert in a field, means that we oftentimes start the conversation like at the halfway point. We don't start the conversation at the beginning. We start the conversation um, downstream because the beginning is so far in our in our in our past of learning um, that that's just not where we are. But that's actually where your audience is. Your audience is often starting in the beginning, struggling with something um, in the early phases of a of a topic, and so we want to explode this topic from the beginning. And I do that by turning to a tool like Answer the Public, and I put in anywhere from a one to a three word phrase. In this example, I kind of stuck with the theme of, of resumes and job hiring. Maybe that's because we just hired a new team member at Pathfinder. <laughs> um, and, and I'm like, all right, if I wanted to create content around the concept of resumes, um, where would I even begin? And I turn to Answer the Public, um, and I get that big wheel that I just showed. Um, that's hard to see. Uh, but that's a really powerful tool and it's going to give you questions, prepositions, comparisons, everything around a topic um, that's out there that people are searching for. And I call this concept qualitative keyword research. I'm not hammering away in a keyword research tool looking for volume. I'm looking for conceptual information. What do people care about in this space? Then I put it into Google and I look in the people also ask and I start to say, huh, um, what can I kind of engender from this information? And I look down below at things like searches related to, 
Um, and again, I'm, I'm exploding the topic from the, the ground up. And I start to just jot down a list on a piece of paper. Um, and I'm a little bit all over the board with my list, but I'm kind of looking at, okay, there are themes here. There are, you know, as there are many topics, there's the how, the what, the why, the when um, type keywords. There are comparisons. Is a resume the same as a CV or resume versus CV? Um, then there are people asking specific questions um, around resume services or resume templates. Um, there are people looking for tools, builders, creators. There are people looking for concepts like resume format or what font I should use. Um, so I'm jotting down uh, a list of topics um, that are, are essentially subtopics. And then I'm going to create an outline. And, um, and really, this is uh, content planning sort of 101. Um, but the reason I'm taking this framework style approach to creating this content um, is because I want to create um, a resource that is a deep dive into a topic. So I don't want to just write a blog post around what should a resume contain or what are employers looking for in a resume in 2021. That's fine. I can do that. I can write a shorter post on a really specific topic. But the search engines are really valuing those deeper dive posts that then have a lot of structure to them um, so that you can kind of get anchored into different components of this depending on what your search query is. And so you can kind of imagine um, if I were to create a piece of content that shares expertise on how to create an XML sitemap in WordPress and I dive straight into, let's say, the Yoast plugin and how to configure it. Um, in, in WordPress um, for an XML sitemap. That's really specific and great, but the search engines would probably appreciate if I started with what is an XML sitemap, why is it important, um, and then got into the how do I create one. And so we're doing that here by creating this outline. Um, and really when I think about this outline, um, I'm getting my big topics at the top and then some of those FAQ things um, you know, what's the best resume template? What about the services piece, that comparison? I can kind of add those sometimes to like a nice um, uh, full-bodied FAQ section at the bottom of my post. Um, when I'm doing this, uh, I'm thinking about calls to action. And this is where the membership or the sales piece of this comes, which is I'm starting to weigh what am I willing to give away and what do I want to charge money for? And so I uh, start at the beginning of the conversation so that I can give away a lot for free and then uh, try to charge for the component that is the how often, um, or in this case, maybe you go with examples or templates um, because that's part of your product offering. Um, and so I can give away the first four pieces of, the, of this in full detail um, because this is just general information. And then when I get into the action um, component of this, um, that's where my, you know, maybe your platform, your, your membership product, really provides its value, that's where you can start to get kind of salesy. So um, you can get salesy and define where you're going to get, where you're going to have that that call to action um, to get somebody to sign up, um, to get someone to, to subscribe um, and ultimately kind of pay a, a recurring revenue um, fee potentially. And so in this case, um, these are places where I can even go in a little bit of detail. I could give you um, here are the five steps to creating a resume, right? I could still give away um, maybe my basic process of, of how to create a resume, um, but there's so much nuance um, and there's so much detail and I can help jumpstart somebody so much in that area if they, um, if they go ahead and, and subscribe um, that, uh, that there's value there. And so this is sort of that framework that you can create um, in your website uh, in, in, in the content you're creating to give a lot away so that it resonates with the search engines while still selling your product. Um, a little SEO tip here is now I, I have my outline. I have, I'm using keywords all over the place, right? So I'm, I'm checking off all these boxes. Um, I figured out how I'm going to turn from giving away my expertise to, to driving sales and growth for my own business um, within the post. Um, and then I'm, I'm just also thinking about my on-site optimization. Um, this is all in the planning. And one of the things the search engines are going to really appreciate is if I use headers when I publish this content um, so that I give them a lot of structure. Because you can imagine this is going to be a pretty long um, you know, blog post or resource guide. So my title is, is an H1. And I like to only have one H1 um, on a page. 
then all of my headers below that are going to be H2s. Um, and then uh, my FAQ section is going to be an H2, but then each FAQ question is, is likely going to be um, an H3. If, if I were to um, create an ordered list, let's say under how to create a resume, I'm going to give away a five-step process. So there's going to be a, an ordered one, two, three, four, five. And, and maybe I'm not going to give a lot of content away with it, but um, I might want to make each one of those, the one, two, three, four, five, um, H3s as well to keep that structure really sound. So that if a person only had my outline, um, they would actually have, or in this case, the search engines, if they only had my outline and this structure, they would actually understand a lot about what the post is about and have it, how to navigate throughout it. That structure really resonates with the search engines. And it's one of those areas of opportunity we see in almost every website um, that we look at. Is, is the ability to add that structure in and make sure those headers are, are really keyword optimized, which they are by, by default um, via this process. So I'm gonna pause for a minute. We've been talking for about 20 minutes. I know sometimes I talk really quickly um, and I wanna take questions and Kim and I were actually chatting earlier um, and, and she had um, a couple good questions uh, right out of the gate around limiting content. So Kim, maybe yeah. I'll turn it over to you to, to ping me with the con the question and then um, sure. we'll talk through some solutions. Yes, definitely. So um, one of the specific sections was that whole, how do you restrict content, but still get some SEO value out of it? Um, we have options in our plugin to hide the complete content and just show the, the notice that it's protected. We have an option to show an excerpt of the content and then show the notice. But a third option is to allow Google and your site visitors a fixed number of free views. And this is a model often used by online newspapers like the New York Times, where they allow maybe five views per month. And they kind of just track this. Um, they profile you as a visitor to their site and they track what content you've accessed. Once you reach their limit, you're hit with, you know, subscribe now, you may not access anything new. And I think that there's an SEO component to why that approach is taken. It's also a great approach to get people appetite for your product, um, for your content. But I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it as an SEO strategy. Awesome. So I love that third option um, that we'll call it like the New York Times sort of mm -hmm. model that we're familiar with, which is I'm going to give you the full content for free, um, but I'm only going to give you, let's just say, five blog posts before um, I'm gonna start to ask you to, to pay or to subscribe. Um, and what I like about this is uh, it lets the search engines fully crawl and index your website, um, and it puts the limitation on the user's behavior. Um, so it's not your first time uh, that you're hit with this, and, and a lot of times you don't even know it, like that first or second article read, you don't even know you're being sort of watched, let's just say. Yeah. Um, you just read the content and you're on your phone or whatever it is. Um, and then maybe like the third or the fourth time you get like a little thing at the bottom of your browser and you're like, Ooh, um, I'm kind of starting to like reading this, uh, websites content and I like what they're throwing out there. And so, um, I might end up in a, in a pay to play space here mm -hmm. and then, okay, great. Now I'm on, let's just say I get my fifth article, I get my pop up and it says, all right, you kind of need to, to, to jump um, on the bandwagon here if you want to continue to get our content for free. Um, and so I like both the SEO piece of this, um, the SEO piece being your content is out there freely um, accessible to the world and to the search engines. Um, and then I also, I personally like the usability model because you're giving a lot before you start to ask someone to pay. Um, I think we've all been there where um, we're trying to read one article on one website and we can get a paragraph of it and they already want our email address and you're just like, oh, no, I'm not there yet. <laughs> like, um, we just, I just got to know this site. Like, I have no idea if I'm willing to pay even a dollar for this. Like, no. um, let alone, like, yeah, I don't know what's more valuable, my dollar or my email address, but I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. And so I bounce. Um, yeah. And so I think um, personally that that third option, it blends SEO and it blends, um, it, yeah, the, the whole kit and caboodle quite nicely. Um, there are exceptions to this and there's other places where maybe those other models play really nicely. Um, and, uh, and you just have to really think through the usability and then also how much of it are you giving to the search engines? How much of it, um, are you letting the search engines get in and crawl? Because when it comes to SEO, we both like, we, we never can get it both ways, right? Yeah. 
So we have uh, a lot of customers that will want a piece of content to rank for a keyword, but they won't want to use the keyword. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work <laughs> like that. Like, they're like, oh, we want to rank for a luxury phrase, but we only want to use the phrase boutique on our website. I'm like, well, that's, I get the language differentiation there, but people search with the word luxury in Google and Google's looking for the word luxury on your page. So, um, you know, that's a simplified example of not being able to get it both ways. And so we also kind of have the same thing. We can't just give away a paragraph or two yeah. of content, get the traffic and then make people pay for the other 2000 words of the article. Um, and so that's why I like number three. I'm gonna bring up Jeff's question quickly. I'll just awesome. answer this. And we have three from other people. So is there an amount of time that you feel safe still getting through the rest of the presentation? Let's fire questions? away the questions. Okay. Um, yeah. So for Jeff, um, Google will get unlimited view. So if you apply one view to the public, Google doesn't actually get counted as a user. It doesn't get tracked as a user. So Google, if you even if you say only one view to an anonymous visitor, Google will have unlimited view just based on how the bot is and is is kind of anonymous and like a private viewer of your site. So it's exempt from the limit is the most clear way to make that phrase. So, okay. The next question comes from Essential Deliverables. Um, they ask, uh, they have links to outside articles on their site and they're curious if they should do a version of those articles rewritten and repackaged and host them in their own blog or their own kind of content library. And would that do more to increase their score or their SEO presence? Awesome. So this is a good question, which is sort of like, um, how much content can we repurpose and grab from other places? And how do we link out? And, and what is that sort of social side of content on our website? How do we interact with others? Um, and so the first thing to note uh, is that if we take content um, from another article and we place it on our website, we're not going to really get traffic from that. So if I think somebody else did a great job um, of explaining uh, how to write a cover letter, and I copy their content and put it on my site and even credit it to them to be slightly less sleazy, even though I did just rip off their content, um, that's not going to not going to really work. That's fine for your audience. Um, it's republishing or content syndication in some ways. Your audience is going to find it if they happen to already be on your website. You can share it on social media. You can put it in an email newsletter. But Google's going to know that the other person published it first and it's their content and not yours. And so you're not going to drive organic growth that way. Um, the, the other piece of the puzzle when it comes to like offsite resources and content is should I link out to them? Can I have a blog post on my topic, but then link out to other websites? And the answer is like two thumbs up. Yes. This is the neighborhood you're playing in. So um, if you're linking out to a partner business um, because they have a better resource on a topic, um, that is of huge value to your reader and Google rewards that value. And so when I'm writing a piece of comprehensive content, there's oftentimes places where if I were to dive into something in a comprehensive manner, this post would be like 100,000 words long, right? Like every section could have, oh, well, then now there's this and then now there's that. And so you have to have some limits and boundaries and only a segment of your audience is gonna be interested in taking some of these deeper dives. And so when I think about it, um, I use these uh, links um, in my content to help that audience that wants to take a deeper dive into a given section by externally linking. I always make it so it opens in a new tab so I don't lose my visitor. They just go over here. Um, and then I, I'm an SEO, so I play it up a little here. And so I'm like, okay, I started writing um, about uh, membership websites a little bit in my topic, right? And um, this is not my depth of expertise. I'm not just a membership website person. Um, and so I'm going to go actually uh, link over to my friend Kim's website. Um, and I'm going to play the game a little bit by looking on her site, seeing if she has content that kind of helps. Um, and I'm like, OK, I Google search her business name and the topic I'm talking about. I'm like, sweet, awesome article. Kim has this topic dialed. I'm going to link to it. I put it in my article and then I ping her um, over email. I ping her over Twitter, whatever it might be. And I'm like, hey, Kim. Um, just a quick note, I love this article and I threw it in here because you know this topic and I only know the edge of this topic. And, um, and so then Kim's like, oh, sweet, I love getting mentioned in an article. So then Kim links to my article in her email newsletter and I drive growth. Um, or Kim throws it up on social media and that's a nice you know, way to get my, my post out there. So this idea of piggybacking off of other people's content and other people's expertise 
um, is a really essential piece to SEO. Um, and it's generally speaking, not copying and pasting somebody else's content and putting it in yours, but rather purposely linking out um, and then trying to get some of the social component out of that. I would say there is value in recognizing if something you're linking to is like a critical learning piece that your audience also needs and then not copying what was written, but deciding whether a version of that content of that topic deserves a full editorial look and a full publish on your own site. Um, I just wouldn't, you know, copy what they said, like Lindsay said, but also to, to decide if it's something your members really need and want to understand, then there might be value in you creating a variation of that content for your own site. Um, That's a really good yeah. point. That's kind of the other piece. It's like I can, my short term solution can be linking out potentially. Mm -hmm. Um, my longer term solution could be, hey, this is in my wheelhouse. And so I do need to create this piece of content um, and, and have it be my, uniquely my own. Um, the other time I use these internal links is sometimes to validate something I'm saying. So I'm just another SEO out there. There's mm -hmm. a lot of us. Um, and so if I put out a um, statistic or if I put out a claim like Google's algorithm is going to change in May 2021 around this concept of of user experience and core web vitals, I'm gonna link over to Google's article. Um, and that's gonna vote confidence back into my post. It's not even just about the fact that somebody might wanna go read that, but Google actually likes that, like I'm kind of crediting over um, a statistic or a, um, or a fact like that. Excellent. Next question comes from the Irish Center of Cincinnati. They asked if Jetpack Pro is any good. Um, and I know that we are gonna talk about tools later on. But um, just throwing this out now, uh, if we touch on it at that point, um, they said that it gives additional options to SEO on the posts. Um, they're thinking about using it. I also had a similar question at the end of the uh, resumes segment of your presentation because the how-to and the FAQ, I know there is like a schema markup for that type of content. And that is an SEO, a, is that more technical SEO strategy? So. Um, yeah. That might be what these Jetpack Pro features are, kind of more schema options to add to your content. So, Awesome. So I'm going to start with the schema markup piece because it's right on where we were. And then we'll jump into the tool piece as well. Um, and uh, and so there's the concept of how-to content um, where like a you know recipe has steps in it or something like that. Um, and then there's also the concept of FAQ content. Um, and sometimes you see those FAQ results actually get pulled directly into the search engines. Mm -hmm. And Google appreciates when you mark up your content with different structured data, also known as schema markup. Think of this as like SEO 102 or 103. So raising the bar a bit here. Mm -hmm. um, and structured data is just like a behind the scenes tagging language that tells Google the obvious. Like on a contact page, it says, this is the business's name, this is their address, these are their hours of operation, this is their email address, um, and this is a photo or a, a logo image. It tells them what, like as humans, we just look at the page and we're like, of course, or it says like movie times. This says, this is the name of the movie and this is the time that it's gonna play and this is where. Um, it's the obvious stuff. So when I look at an FAQ block on a web page, I'm like, this is the FAQ block. It says FAQ. Then there's a question. Then there's an answer, so on and so forth. Schema just tells Google, this is the question. This is its answer. This is the first step of the how-to. This is the second step. And what that's powerful in doing um, is it makes it easier for Google to repurpose your content and to showcase it in what we call like a featured snippet. Um, so it makes it easier for Google to do that um, it also tells Google what a page is all about. So I can tag something as this is a recipe, this is an FAQ page, this is a blog post, this is a video. Um, the challenge with schema markup is sometimes you're a little bit of two things. You're a blog post with an FAQ section. You're a blog post with a how-to in it. And so F, um, schema markup can be a little fragmented. We tag things sometimes in multiple ways and it's not always nested. And the WordPress ecosystem is working on this. Um, and, and Yoast, I know, has been a big uh, leader in that space of trying to make the markup a little less fragmented and a little more like nested and organized. Okay. Um, in the meantime, I use um, those structured data markups for FAQ and how to's all the time in my blog posts because I think um, they're really powerful for SEO. So that's structured data. Um, Jetpack Pro is great. Um, so too are the other uh, big players in the SEO space. I consider them like multi-functional um, SEO plugins. We're gonna look at each one and I've got a resource for you. Um, and so we'll get there towards the end of the article, but 
Um, the biggest thing to note with all these things is their tools. So it's more about how you configure them and less about which one you pick. Um, sweet. So I'm going to dive back in, run oh, you guys. We have through. one more. We have oh, one yeah. really short one. Okay. It. This is Jean. Jean asks if Facebook links to your site and mentions are used by search engines and maybe part of that offsite SEO. Do they help that score? Uh, social and offsite SEO overlap, but not as much as we'd probably all like. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had to pick between a link from a website and a link like from a mention on Facebook, definitely the link on the website from an SEO standpoint. That other link could go super viral, right? If the other person's audience on Facebook is really good. So the overlap there for SEO is more in that, um, let's say I publish something and somebody else um, throws it on Twitter for me and they have a huge audience, way bigger than mine. And so it gets a lot of views and a lot of um, people looking at it, more people commenting. It's not so much that Google's watching that conversation happen over on Twitter. They don't model the social web all that well in their algorithm. It's more that then other people on social see and read my post, and then some of those people might link to it, like via a real link. And so um, there is an overlap, and you want your content to get good exposure on social, but it's not quite the like direct injection that we wish it were um, of, oh, this post just went viral or even just got some really good engagement, and now um, it's going to just like rank number one on the search results. If only. If only. Yeah. Well, so anyone else has a question? There's a couple here. I'll bring them up at the end with any extra time that we can tack on. We can keep Lindsay with us for a while longer, but I'm gonna let her get back to the presentation. Awesome. I'll, I'll go relatively quickly, as you can see, um, and save plenty of time for you guys um, at the end. And, um, and so now I want to just talk briefly about this next concept, which is repurposing your content. Um, Creating content, as you guys very well know, is really time consuming. Um, we want to get every last drop of value out of it. And, uh, and so we've focused a lot on how to share your expertise on your website, you know, through this model of, of a blog post or a resource. Um, but then we want to take that same piece of content and get it out there off our website in our email marketing, our social media, YouTube, guest blogging, et cetera. Um, and so I really, uh, I think a lot of people think of creating content for SEO as being a one-step approach. Um, and, and it zipped ahead. Just publish a new blog post and you're done. Um, but really, when you're doing it well, um, you're taking a focus area. I just did this around the concept of Google Analytics 4 um, and, and said, OK, let's take a deep dive into Google Analytics 4. First, I wrote a blog post. Then I created a video for YouTube. Then I started sharing both of this content out on social media via our email list. And then I prepared a webinar and I pitched it to my own audience. So I did it for my own audience. And then now I'm out there pitching it to partners. Hey, do you want me to do a webinar for you about Google Analytics 4? Awesome. Sign me up. And so what I'm doing out of this is I'm building everything. I'm building expertise and sharing expertise. I'm growing my authority. I'm getting out there in other audiences um, and sharing information. They're linking back to my content. Um, and I'm engendering trust because then people are coming back and saying, hey, this was an awesome webinar. And I'm adding testimonials back into the webinar page um, and reinforcing this. And so uh, that's really what the name of the game is. And then I sort of move on to my next topic. Um, and, and for you guys, um, just seeing and being honest with yourself, like where are you, where are you stopping and sharing your expertise? My guess is for a lot of people, it's somewhere around here. Um, in your audience space in a lot of places that that aren't membership oriented that aren't they stop here um, But I bet you guys are often getting a here and and this would just be to encourage you to, to kind of round this around um, And really try to get out there with that expertise um, By by being on a webinar being on a podcast speaking at an event um, And and getting building that authority piece, which is so powerful all right, so this is the last section. This is why I'm saying we have plenty of time for more questions. Um, but I want to take a deeper dive in SEO tools. Um, I want to talk about what tools you should be utilizing and, and then help try to answer like what SEO plugin is the best, which is a big one out there. Um, so the good news I have for you is that the best SEO tools are free. Um, Google Analytics and the Google Search Console uh, for you all is a must. Google My Business is a little more hyper local. You know, you think restaurants are like an interior designer, um, but there can be a place like Pathfinder SEO. Um, it has a Google My Business listing. We have an office. We have a service area. It's just really big. Um, and, uh, and we're on Google Maps because we want people to leave us reviews there. 
and the occasional person might stop by our office, um, at least in the old days. And, we do have uh, a number of businesses that are association based and they focus around a geographic location like the Bar Association of Philadelphia. So that might be one case to represent yourself with the Google My Business and you are actually geographic. So I can see that as a membership piece that you might have to like stretch your brain a little bit in some cases, but. That's a really good point. And, and yes, um, most businesses I think belong on Google Maps. And if you're, if you're in that situation where you serve an area, um, but you don't have a physical location, with Google My Business, you can have a, a business location, think restaurant, where you serve people at your restaurant. You can, on the other hand, be uh, a plumber where you have an office maybe, but you don't actually want to even put the address out there. You never want someone to stop by. Um, and you have a service area, right? So you're, you're in a geographic radius. Or in this example um, that Kim is giving, you're, you're in that services component and you maybe don't want to put your physical address. You can hide your address and then do a, a service area um, around your business. And these are contextual clues for Google, right? They kind of trust, if you're just a website out there, they're like, hmm, I wonder you know, how real they are. If you have a Google My Business listing and it's on Google Maps and it has a defined service area and it fits into some kind of category and there's some nice reviews, that's gonna build that trust. That's gonna build some of that offsite SEO. It's low hanging fruit out there um, for you to jump on. So, um, these are the, the three must um, you know, dive into. They're all free. Um, and the Search Console is gonna be a really powerful platform for you um, to see how your content's getting crawled and indexed, like are there any issues? Um, and then also you can look at the performance and actually look at keyword data. Um, you can see what keywords are leading the traffic to your website now, which of your blog posts are the best, um, you know, we're an SEO company and we don't do this enough for our own business, but um, we were looking in the other day and found like of our top 10 posts and the keywords driving into them, we would never have guessed that five of those posts fit into that, that definition. They were just like, we wrote them once, they're out there. And now it gives us real good clarity to go back into those five posts and like raise the bar because they're getting a lot of traction. They're getting a lot of growth, but maybe they were written two years ago. Maybe they don't have any calls to action in them. Um, I probably, you know, didn't sell enough in them and things like that. And, uh, and so search console is like, um, you know, if I spend more time in search console for clients than any other SEO tool, uh, I've included a link here to a blog post, um, that looks at SEO tools in way more depth than this. Um, but, uh, that's out there for you. And, uh, and these slides are publicly available as well. So that's, tools. Uh, the next thing you need to think about is plugins. Um, and, and so I added the three biggest, um, what I consider a multi-function SEO plugin. Uh, Jetpack's not in the list because it actually is like a multi-function plugin well outside of just SEO. Um, although it has some nice built-in SEO functionality. Um, and at the end of the day, your website really needs like one multifunction SEO plugin. So we don't need Yoast and Rank Math or Rank Math and all in one. Um, and, uh, and each one of these plugins has its advantages and then, uh, you know, disadvantages. And so picking the right plugin for you is going to depend a little bit on what you care most about. Like, do you care most about cost? Do you care most about the SEO education and support that comes with it? Um, do you have uh, a lot of redirects to manage? You know, there, there are a lot of different components to this. Um, I will say as an SEO practitioner, in addition to, to being kind of an SEO coach, um, I install Yoast nine times out of 10 um, on websites. It's, it's uh, one of the older plugins, not the oldest plugin in the space, but the thing I love about Yoast is it's built by SEOs. So um, there's a ton of education. The plugin um, really evolves as the search engines evolve. And um, and the Yoast team is like really hooked in with the, the Google team out there. And so um, there's a lot of cross collaboration there um, and is really involved in the WordPress ecosystem. So I find a lot of value um, out of their plugin. Uh, and, and, and that's where I go most of the time. Um, I've seen some really cool stuff coming out of uh, Rank Math recently um, with some cool integrations into the Search Console. Um, I haven't used All-in-One SEO Pack in the last month or two, but I know it's evolving really quickly and there's a whole lot more detail um, about this in, in this uh, blog post down here. Um, but at the end of the day, as I talked about earlier about like, should I use Jetpack or maybe one of these? 
Um, it's, it's more about how you configure these plugins. How do you leverage the tool than which tool do you pick? Um, so as we all know with WordPress and with plugins, it's not just installing the plugin that does magic. It's, it's what you do, how you build that plugin out. Um, and, and so, um, that is the case with, with SEO plugins. There's not like a magic wand that Yoast is doing behind the scenes for you. Um, there are some components of that, but a lot of it is then what do you, what do you put into the page title field? How do you write a meta description? Um, what kind of content are you publishing? How are you linking between your posts? Um, and, and Yoast just helps um, with that. It doesn't do it for you. Um, and then there's this question about what about SEO software? Um, there's a lot of big players in the SEO software space. Ahrefs, um, SEMrush, Moz Pro are probably the three biggest. And these are super powerful SEO software or tools out there. They do keyword research, backlink analysis. Um, they look for duplicate content. They track your rankings. They do reports. Some of these even go outside of SEO and move into the, the world of paid search like Google Ads. Um, and, and they are super robust tool sets. Um, any one of these is great. Um, the challenge being with all of them is they can be pretty overwhelming. Um, all of a sudden you have Google Analytics, Google Search Console, Google My Business. Um, you've got your plugin uh, in WordPress and then now you're about to layer in a third software that's gonna give you a whole heck of a lot of data. Um, if you are an SEO or working on an enterprise level website, this data is gonna be pretty important to you, right? Like this is, this is your bread and butter. You do this all day. You are gonna be able to look at this data and make meaningful insights pretty quickly and then take action. If you are a beginner or intermediate SEO, um, then you might just find yourself really overwhelmed by this data and not sure what to do with it um, or taking action. But what you're doing to take action is like um, fixing little errors and things that pop up. Like it tells you, you you're missing page titles on these or um, you have duplicate meta descriptions over here. So you're spending all your time kind of looking at that and not enough of your time doing the big stuff, the writing, the blog posts, the getting on a webinar, uh, the publishing a video on YouTube. You're, you're kind of in the trenches and you're not gonna see the growth out of those trenches as you would out of the big stuff. Um, and so uh, that's sort of um, a big part of where Pathfinder SEO was born um, out of this idea of needing to bridge education and process um, with tools um, and then with coaching. And so we call this uh, this approach a guided approach to SEO. Um, and it brings in the tools um, that you need, um, kind of the best out of Google Analytics, the best out of um, the Google Search Console, the best um, types of uh, components of the Ahrefs and the SEMrush. Um, and then it layers in a process so that if you have a couple hours to spend on SEO, um, you don't spend all your time learning and analyzing. You actually spend a little bit of time learning and analyzing and then like 80% of your time doing um, and, and changing that dynamic um, and really getting into a step-by-step -step, um, steady approach to SEO is where we're seeing customers drive a lot of growth. Um, and so here I've got my contact info, um, a coupon code if you want to check out Pathfinder, 50% off for the first three months. Um, and, and you're welcome to reach out with questions um, be it after this uh, webinar via these contact channels um, or uh, right now with a handful more questions. I will add to that, that looking at SEO earlier rather than later and getting involved in a program like Pathfinder SEO that can teach you what not to do early on is a lot easier than being where I am now, like 10 years down the road with our blog. And I, if I look at my Ahrefs or my SEM rush, if someone ran that for me, it is an overwhelming list of like little nits to fix. But if you knew that from the baseline, from the start of your project, you wouldn't have, you know, permalinks that are too long and you wouldn't, you know, put some of these structural things in place that, you know, could be eliminated from the get go. So um, maybe SEO, looking at SEO, even before you're too large of a, of a site is, is very smart. Yeah, it's always, um, it, I think of it as like building a house uh, you know, you want to put a cable, you know, uh, have cable TV over on a wall and then you decide, but you're like, I can't deal with that right now. And having mm -hmm. built a house, I sort of remember those phases of being like, that's great. I'm probably going to want that. But like, I am so overwhelmed by the day to day of everything else I'm doing to build this house. I can't worry about that right now. 
And so the reality is you can circle back around and make that improvement down the road. Um, but you kind of go back to when there was no drywall on the walls and you're like, Ooh, I sure wish I had another <laughs> nice through here um, as everybody told me to do. Um, yeah. And so, yes, if, if you can move in parallel on, on these different things uh, from the ground up, it's going to be easier, more cost effective, drive more growth, but it's never too late either. Um, it just gets to be a little bit more where, where you often want to start with a coach um, and kind of weigh things out to be like, okay, now I got a heap and pile of content and I'm mm -hmm. already have growth and I'm scared to change things because I have some good traffic, but I think I could have more. That's where the coaching piece of Pathfinder can really come into play. Do check it out. It is pathfinderseo.com and then the coupon code memberships2021 will get you 50% off your first three months. And, or you can bug Lindsay on Twitter if you want. Okay, I'm gonna open up for more questions. Let me track back to where we were. We talked about Facebook links. Okay, we'll pull up this one. This one's a nice topic. Um, so tools like you talked about, SEM Rush, they're gonna help you identify keywords, but there's the negative side, which keyword stuffing. Um, so Graham asks, how detrimental is keyword stuffing within articles or page content? It's pretty detrimental because it makes for really poor, uh, poor reading, right? Nobody wants to read an article that uses the same phrase a million mm -hmm. times over again. Um, and so we do want to avoid keyword stuffing. And um, usually people fall on one end of the spectrum. Either they don't use their keywords at all or they use them too much, right? There's like, there is a middle ground and it's not um, a, a magic science. It's not like use each keyword three times. Okay. Um, this is the perfect density or have a certain density because the number of times you should use it will change based on how long the post is. Um, so there, there aren't necessarily like, a fixed guideline for perfect, um, you wanna make sure you're not on either extreme, keyword stuffing or not using keywords at all. And a lot of times for me, this comes down to jotting down notes again, and the notes I jot down are around language and semantics. So we talked about how we can get too close to a topic. Um, and then when you get really close to a topic, sometimes you use the same phrase over and over again, because you're like, that's what I'm talking about here. And so what you can do is go to Google and put in that short phrase and then actually go over to the image search results and look at, um, they have like these filters at the top. And it's going to tell you like Google sees this word and then they think of all these like segments or these similar words. So you're looking for synonyms. You're looking for context, context, um, just like we did in onsite optimization. So if I'm writing um, a blog post about resumes, I'm not going to say resume over and over and over again. Um, I'm going to want to use contextual phrases about um, things like how to create is a contextual phrase, um, applying for a job, uh, your first, like your first resume versus a resume for somebody, you know, right out of college, um, a resume, you know, no experience, lots of experience. The word experience and resume, they, they have overlap. Format and resume has overlap. And so um, it's about making sure that your post, your content reads really well. And a lot of times reading really well is explaining things using kind of different ways instead of always sticking that keyword right back in there. So I write about SEO and instead of saying SEO a million times, I try to use the phrase get found. So get found on Google. Um, you're looking for ways to swap out one word with something that means the same thing, but gives more context. We recently in our site, I have a, a part-time team member who tackled a bunch of common support issues we're facing. And I said, see what you could find on our blog that would answer these questions. Because I knew every single one of them had an article, nearly everyone, I don't want to brag. Um, and there was something she could not find. And I was like, write me what you searched for. What did you put into the search bar of our site to find your answer? And it was so informative because I realized these articles talked about member pricing and I really should have said the word subscription or I should have said the word recurring payment and they were missing those similar terms that it's just who you are and what term you're more familiar with is what you will search for. So that's really good advice. Awesome, yeah, and that's a good exercise that you went through. I need to do that. Yeah, it's, it was eye-opening. I was like, why couldn't she find it? I, it didn't make sense to me. Lou asks um, about Yoast. SEO specifically, um, and you spoke about WordPress being natively SEO well-structured from a technical SEO standpoint, and what is the added value of a tool like Yoast or any of the others you mentioned? 
Awesome. So I think about um, a tool like Yoast as being an infrastructure tool for SEO. Um, and so uh, WordPress out of the box doesn't come with some functionality, like maybe one really important piece is that XML sitemap. So um, a, a platform like WordPress doesn't fire up an XML sitemap for every single website. They make you decide if that's a, a functionality, a feature you need by installing a plugin that does that. And there's a million things in WordPress, right? That like core does so much. And then you layer in the things that matter to you. I care about memberships. I care about SEO. I care about recurring payments, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so SEO, these plugins are that, that layer for SEO. So XML sitemaps, managing your 301 redirects, creating and implementing custom page titles and meta descriptions, verifying your site with the Google Search Console. These are just a few of the things um, these plugins do for you. They do some content grading to give you feedback. Um, so we've talked very subjectively about like it, using a keyword, but they can actually give you more feedback, um, green lights and things like that around how your content is doing. And so um, that's why you sort of need one of those plugins is, is to, to raise the bar there um, and to let you uh, implement or execute on your SEO strategy. Excellent. This is an interesting question. I think kind of along the course restricting content versus public content piece. Um, Anatoly asks if it's a good idea to use posts for videos and release kind of free video lessons. Um, I'm guessing and or I'm assuming that there is a course platform um, or an LMS involved in this site. So there might be a library of, you know, 20 video lessons linked together in, in a chronological order for, for someone taking that course. So how could we repurpose an aspect or a segment of a course as a public piece. So what's the SEO? I'm sure it's yes, 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 do it. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so video is really important for a couple reasons. One is YouTube is its own search engine. Um, and whenever you're trying to learn something like think how to or discover, YouTube tends to be one of those places that that you might turn. And so when you're looking for expertise, when you're looking for something, um, you might go there and actually search on YouTube. Also, uh, Google pulls YouTube videos into the search results. So it's like free organic traffic, but it's coming from a different block of the search results. It's not those traditional, you know, this is the snippet. Um, this, it's like a little video carousel. So your video content is gonna be really important. And if you're good at creating video because um, you have a free course out there or a paid course out there, um, then yes, you should have some of that video content out there publicly. Um, it doesn't always have to be like the first course of the video, but instead it could be a short version. So um, maybe I have a video out there that is what is SEO or what tools for SEO is, you know, our best. Well, I, I'm going to make it pretty short, three to five minutes. And it's not going to share all of my expertise. You couldn't in a three to five minute window. It's going to share a snippet. It's going to show how I teach, how I communicate, what kind of, you know, expertise I have. Um, and then I can embed that in the blog post with the written word. So a lot of times I'll have a blog post, a little intro at the top with like um, the organization or like the agenda, like the five things I'm going to cover. And those are anchored links so that you could skip ahead, you know, mm -hmm. to the what, to the why, to the how, to the FAQ, whatever you care about. Um, then I have my video, the like three to five minute version. And then I have all my content. Um, and somewhere in those, I have my calls to action to get someone from watching my video and reading my content to giving me their email address, maybe for another video. So maybe my three to five minute video is free, but my webinar recording where I spend an hour talking about this and teaching about it is the, the upgrade that gets me the email address that I then try to sell that person into, into my membership world. Perfect, okay. The Irish Cincinnati, uh, Center of Cincinnati asks about the Google My Business product, it sounds like they have an option that you can create maybe like a free landing page or a free website. And is that an alternative to having one for their organization's website? Or what is, is that worth creating through their platform? I'd say for most people in this audience, it's probably going to be way too small and limiting of a website. Um, I think of that as being a good platform uh, for someone that's going to create like a one page website, maybe for their brand new business um, in like a services industry or something like that mm -hmm. um, with a hyper local audience. And uh, it's just a way to get off the ground. So some people go to Google My Business and verify their business before they ever have a website, right? So right. they have a business, they have a phone number, they have hours of operation, they have no website. And so Google's just like, hey, you should probably have a website. 
Um, and so they use, I think it's like their Google sites or whatever to let you throw up a quick website. Um, but WordPress, everything else you're building elsewhere is a million times better. So don't, don't fall into that one. Excellent. Um, let me see. We did good for Anatoly. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. This one is specifically around a nonprofit and a startup of a nonprofit. And if there's any special SEO considerations um, linked to being an NPO. Um, there are no special um, SEO considerations, really. Uh, one thing you can do to give a little is um, on your supporters, board of directors, whatever pages you have out there about the people that help your, your nonprofit thrive. Um, you can link to their websites in the bio, in the mentions of the businesses that support you. That's going to help their SEO. It's like an added value. So when people, you know, donate or support uh, you, you can give a little back to them. Um, that's not why they're doing it, but it's a nice, it's a nice thing to do for your your uh, network essentially. Um, so that's that's one piece for SEO. What I'd say is a bigger opportunity for your own growth um, is actually the Google um, nonprofit grant program, and so. Uh, I, um, this is via Google ads and they give, um, I think it's up to $10,000 a month of free advertising to nonprofits. And there are limitations on how you use it and all that kind of stuff and how you manage it. But actually getting a Google grant, um, is a pretty easy process, no matter how big or small you are of a nonprofit. And, uh, and you can work with agencies that specialize in this platform. And so a lot of times when we consult with nonprofits, we say do a baseline of SEO to make sure like your foundation is really sound. Um, and, and so you can kind of consider it like a quick start or a jump start approach and then pay attention to it. But don't invest like thousands of dollars or tens of hours in SEO every month. Move that over and get going with the Google grant program because it's it's free advertising from Google. Um, and it can complement or even way outperform your organic results um, because you have such control over your ad text and everything there. So check out uh, Google for nonprofits um, and their grant program. Would you say that the um, linking out to the key supporters um, of your organization or foundation is a two way street that you could also give them like an asset to put in their website's footer? Like I, I'm a supporter of, you know, Kim Coleman's foundation for raising chickens or whatever. You know? That's a great uh, way to spin that around is to, yes, give them something to link back to you. And so your offsite strategy um, is a lot out of your donors um, and things like that. And so if um, let's say you have somebody on your board of directors, um, you can link to their website and then they probably have a bio on their own website and they can add in their bio. Kim is, you know, a member of or a board, you know, board member of this organization. She cares a lot about whatever. And um, and so it's a two way street and it's a way of, of getting some backlinks. So, yeah, that's a great point. Perfect. This one is everyone's favorite topic. The downside of a permalink restructure. I just did a huge <laughs> permalink restructure project. And oh, no. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I change my my permalink structure when it's bad, right? So uh, if you come into a website and it has these huge permalinks, um, or uh, I'm not a huge fan of date stamping content unless you're like a news organization or something like that. Like I'm trying to put out evergreen content, so I don't put the date that I published the article in my URLs because um, I, it's all over the board. Um, and that information can be behind the scenes or in the published date, but it's not in my permalink structure. Um, and so you come into projects and you wish you had known a little more about SEO so that you dialed in your permalink structure before you got started. Um, and now you think there could be value. Um, you can change your permalinks. Uh, you want to do so via like a, a strategic one time project, not like randomly changing them as you update and edit posts over time. So you really try to be comprehensive, like crawl the whole site, figure out what structure I want to build execute on that structure and put in 301 redirects in place. And um, usually what I see is if I go from bad to good and I do my 301 redirects, I don't see any even temporary downturn. Mm -hmm. um, things hum along and then they improve over time. Um, if, uh, if I'm going from like uh, not great to a little better and then I do it, uh, then sometimes I see that's not great because I didn't like make enough improvement. I just sort of was oh. nitpicky about something. Um, so I try to make sure I'm, I'm only changing them when, when it's a big thing um, and, and doing it on a strategic basis and then dial in your 301 redirects. 
And also, if you've had a bunch of redirects already in the system, go back and make sure you don't have redirect chains so that you're like, go to this one. Uh -huh. Nope, now go here. You want to like have A go to C, not A go to B, B go to C. Um, so there is there is a little bit of work that goes into changing that across a whole site. You can, um, WordPress has in the, in the block editor, there's a permalink section. So before publishing, you can give your generated permalink a once over and say like, oh, it doesn't need these filler words. We can tighten this up or we can make it a little more specific. Um, even for this webinar event, I created a blog post with content announcing the event, but I intend, and maybe this, maybe you'll tell me this isn't great SEO, but I intend to use that then as a permanent home for the video, for the content surrounding it. So I made sure that my permalink didn't say Tuesday, Fe Thursday, February 4th, and then I made sure it was SEO for membership site. And yep. that nice slug will be the permanent home and I won't have this kind of one-time use blog article that I don't know what to do with down the road because it was just like an event announcement, let's say. So that's awesome. And if you're if you're thinking ahead, um, I always check the permalink and I almost always edit it. Um, and I like to kind of tidy it up um, and make sure it's really concise. Uh, but the other thing is um, we often see, you know, we a lot of content we publish that in 2021 is a big part of the appeal, right? Mm -hmm. So your expertise in this time frame. Um, and instead of doing that, what you want to do is think evergreen, which means your permalink would be your expertise this year. And then every year you're updating the same URL. So it's like the same if you have an ongoing every year, we have a 4th of July event um, in our area. We don't want 4th of July 2021, 4th of July 2021. We just want 4th of July this year, or 4th of July in and then the location. Um, mm -hmm. and then every time that this needs a refresh, um, I'm evolving on existing content. I'm not publishing my 15th 4th of July blog post um, on the site. That's good. Good, good, good advice. Okay. I think that's kind of all for our questions. I'm browsing through. Someone just joined. They're excited to learn more. There is going to be a replay of this. It'll last forever on YouTube or on Facebook if you've been streaming um, through either platform. So um, if you have questions that you didn't get to ask, Lindsay, Give your slides still up to, to show just for the very final wrap up. Um, she has shared her Twitter, her email address, and also a promotion for uh, with us for her Pathfinder SEO product. Oh, you're ready to bring it up. Here it is one more time. So if you did just join, um, watch the recap and we'll give one final pitch to checking out this guided SEO platform. Lindsay, we really appreciate you being here with us today. I think everyone learned a lot, no matter how much SEO experience you have. I know that I did and I've been struggling with SEO for our own projects for some time. So I appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Kim and everybody else. Great questions and, uh, and have a nice rest of your day. Bye.